Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Here, we begin to find in our minds for the first time a little bit of love and patience and tolerance and compassion and goodwill toward our fellow man. In other words, God's thinking began to replace the self-thinking, which was the result of those resentments. And we said this would be a very positive happening. At least in one-third of our little store, we kind of got it straightened up. We're in much less chance of drinking now than we were before we started the inventory process. Now, we don't want to give you the impression, though, that you can always be 100% free of resentments. You know, God never gave us anything bad. It's only what we do with things that determine whether they're going to be for bad or good. And a resentment used correctly can be used for a worthwhile purpose, and it can become a benefit to us if we use it right. For instance, if somebody does something to me that threatens my self-esteem, that embarrasses me, puts me down in the eyes of other people, and if I look at what they did very carefully in my reaction to it, <clears throat> perhaps I'll be able to see where I need to make some changes in my life. And if I go ahead and make those changes, then that becomes a very positive happening as the result of a resentment. Let me give you a good example. Let's say we're all living in the neighborhood. The old houses are all run down. A lot of them's got broken window panes, torn window screens. Everybody's house looks about the same, and I'm very complacent about that situation. I go home from work in the evening, I sit on the front porch, and I rock, and I rock, and I enjoy life. But one day I look up, and some idiot has moved in across the street. He's out there painting his house. <clears throat> He's fixing his window panes, replacing his window screens. Makes my house look bad. I say, who in the hell is he moving in here screwing up the whole neighborhood? <laughs> And if I use that resentment right, though, and look at my house, and I become a little bit ashamed of my house, then the next thing you know, I paint my house. I fix up the window panes and window screens. My next-door neighbor resents me for doing so, and the next thing you know, he fixes up his house. And after a while, he's got the whole, God's got the whole neighborhood cleaned up like it should have been in the first place. But we alcoholics won't use the resentment that way. We'll sit there on our porch, and we'll rock, and we'll rock, and we'll resent, and we'll resent. Thirty days later at midnight, we'll go over and burn his damn house down, and we'll show him. <laughs> so resentments are not all bad. It depends on what we do with them. If it causes us to make some changes, to have some positive things happening, then a resentment is a good thing. It just depends on what we do with them. If we let them sit in our head and fester and fester and fester, then we just get sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. But if we can use them to make some good positive changes, then resentments are okay. We'll never be completely free of them. Now this morning, <clears throat> we're going to start directly into the second common manifestation of self. And as we talked yesterday, that is going to be fear. So this morning we're going to take a little look at our fears according to the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. Before we look into that, let's go to page 18 for a moment. Remember yesterday we said we were going to find the facts and we were going to face the facts and we were engaging in a process to ultimately accept the facts. And it said also that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Spiritual not only means my relationship with God, it means my own internal moral fiber when that's straightened out. And we're engaging in that process as we speak. And remember that Dr. Jung told Rowan that ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were the guiding force of the lives of these people, are suddenly cast to one side. So I'm basically looking at my ideas, emotions, and attitudes. And where did I get my ideas, emotions, and attitudes? Well, I'm going to read this first paragraph. It tells my whole story to tell you the truth. I find myself on every paragraph in this book, if I would have wanted to. But this one especially. It said, an illness of this sort, and we've come to believe it in an illness, involves those about us in, no, in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him, and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. 
and it goes to all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, whoop lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents, and anyone can increase the list. In other words, alcoholism is a family illness. And if you live with one of us very long, you're going to be affected by it, there's no doubt. And I look back into my life, and I know today that my dad was an alcoholic. He had an obsession to drink. My mother had an obsession to see that he didn't drink. <laughs> Seemed like every time my dad took a drink, my mother had a personality change. <laughs> and that's the way it went. She began to raise hell with him. My dad, we left the farm back in the late 30s and come out to California. We didn't fit in too well here at that time. And uh, we moved back to Oklahoma, back to Tulsa. My dad was ill-equipped to fit into the big city of Tulsa, being a farmer. And so he got a job as an ice man, delivering ice to people's houses. That was back when we didn't have any refrigeration. And six days a week, back-breaking work, hard back-breaking work, carrying ice to people's houses. And on Saturday, he'd get paid, and he'd go down by my aunt, who was a bootlegger, and pick up a pint of that white light, and we called it, and um, come home to have a drink. Now, my dad deserved a drink. I believe he did. After six days of hard work, he deserved a drink. And uh, I think he should have had a drink. My mother saw that dollar or two that he spent on that booze taken away from these five kids that they had. And she raised hell in my dad about that. And we know that alcoholism is a progressive illness. It gets worse over a period of time. My dad continued to drink, and my mother continued to raise Cain with him. And eventually there was fights going on around my house. And see, I grew up in this. I was just a little old kid, and I was affected by it emotionally, although I didn't realize it at the time. And as I got bigger, these things got bigger within me. Uh, eventually, my dad, uh, from time to time, would pull out a gun or a knife and threaten my mother with it and us kids. And uh, there was some times that he would tell us kids that he was taking our mother out and was going to kill her this weekend. And I'm just six or seven or eight years old, see. Scared the heck out of me, and I began to wonder if he was going to do that, and it affected me emotionally. Eventually, she had to have him arrested and put in the Eastern State Hospital of Anita, which is our local nut house. And they didn't have any alcoholic treatment facilities in those days, so they put my dad, who was an alcoholic, in the criminally insane ward. And he was to stay there till he got well. Think about that. And my dad was there for three years and seven months and 13 days. And he was an alcoholic. He couldn't get out. And from time to time, my brother and I would hitchhike up there to see my dad and take him a couple of dollars and a carton of cigarettes. And we'd go back into the criminally insane ward where nobody, but nobody's supposed to see what's going on back there. And I saw those things as a young child. I began to get some ideas, emotions, and attitudes which would become the guiding force of my life for a long time. And one day, coming home from up there, we'd hitchhike up and hitchhike back. A thought came to me was like this. If God, see, I, I don't know where this came from, but if God is going to do this to me and to us and to hell with him, I'll not be going anymore either. If I ever get big enough, they can't catch me, I'm not going to church. And I didn't either. And I lived my life that way. And another thought came to me one day up there was this, that if it hurts like this to love people, I'm going to quit loving people. It hurts too bad. So I began to push people out of my life. And another thought came to me one day was, if anything good is going to happen in my life, it's going to be happening because I, all along, made it that way. So I didn't need God, nothing, or nobody. When I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous, I had the spiritual knowledge of a seven or eight, nine year old boy. I had the coping skills of an eight or nine or ten year old boy. And I had the sexual knowledge of an 11, 12, 13 year old boy. Do you think I didn't need an inventory? <laughs> For sure I did. So anyhow, I thought this, these ideas and emotions and attitudes that I had gotten were very brave thoughts on my part. I didn't realize until after I come into A, way after I come into A, that they were the most fearful ideas, emotions, and attitudes that a person could possibly have because they caused me an awful lot of problems. One of the things, I mean, they'll divorce you for these kind of ideas, emotions, and attitudes. They put you in jail for those sort of things. They did that for me. What I'm trying to say is they're not very good coping skills the ones that I acquired on my home. So when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, like I said, I thought I was a very brave individual, courageous, but I was very, very fearful and did not know it until after I did this inventory process. So now let's go to page 67. Bottom of the page, 
It said, notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Ms. Jones, the employer, and the wife. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. You know, I did the crime, I did the time. And I get in there and I just think to myself, well, why? I mean, I'm, I'm not like this. I'm not like this. I don't need to be here. I shouldn't be here. But I was just like that. Of course, I didn't know that. But did not we, our, ourselves, set the ball rolling? Sometimes we think that fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. Now, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. Here it is for me. <coughs> Wasn't it because that self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but didn't fully totally solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. I set the ball rolling with my ideas, emotions, and attitudes. I did the crimes, I did the times, and all the time I thought I was brave. Come to find out I was the most fearful individual you could possibly know. And I see people today running around the, the cities and here and there, and they're pushing and shoving and stepping in front of you in lines and doing this and that, and I know what's wrong with them. Man, they're so full of fear they're not going to get what they want. You see, and they're rushing ahead of everybody, pushing and shoving. And I, I know them. I spot them. Because I'm just like that. I used to be just like that. On that first paragraph, in that first paragraph on page 68, we see basically the same set of instructions to review our fears as we did for resentments, except worded just a little bit differently. So what we did in order to avoid any confusion, we made up another little inventory sheet, and we called it a review of fears. And it looks almost exactly like the resentment sheet, except we'll be dealing with a review of fears. It tells us in that first paragraph, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. So we had the same five columns here with fears that we have with resentments. And in column one, we put down who or what do I fear. Now, we men tend to have a little problem with this particular thing because we like to think that we don't have any fear. We're tough and we're macho. We're, macho. But we're not talking about those fears that run through our, uh, that those physical fears. We're talking about through those fears that run through our head, control us and rule us and dominate us. I didn't think I had very much fear until I started putting them down on paper. And I find that I, like everybody else, I had fears connected with my marriage. I had fears connected with what other people thought of me. I had fears connected with my job. I had fears connected with the police department. I had fears connected with the Internal Revenue Service. I had fears connected with, connected with, connected with, and connected with. I was amazed when I started putting them down. Just like with resentments, I didn't think I had very many resentments, so I started writing them down on paper. And when I began to see myself filling out literally sheet after sheet after sheet on these fears, I began to realize for the first time how much fear really does control and rule and dominate my thinking. Just like resentments controlled and ruled it, fear did the same thing. Now, I've made a decision in step three to let God direct my thinking, and if I've got that many fears in my mind, and those fears are directing my thinking, and God can't, and it's just that simple. And I don't think any of us are ever going to really realize how much fear we really do have until we put them all down on a piece of paper and see them in their entirety for the first time. You can only see one at a time in your head. But when you get them down on paper and see how many you really do have all at one time, then we begin to see how much fear really does control us and rule us and dominate us. So column one is a very simple thing. We just make a list of those things that we fear. Column two, the cause. Now this is not an attempt to psychoanalyze ourselves. Now I'm not going to say that I'm afraid of the dark because Mother sent me on a potty sideways when I was two years old. Just like with resentments, we're supposed to have some fear. Fear brings caution and keeps us from getting hurt. 
Yeah, I'm a little bit afraid of the dark. Why? Well, I don't have headlights that I can't see at night. And that kind of fear brings caution and keeps me from getting hurt when I go outside at night. I'm a little bit afraid of heights. Why? Well, I don't have wings and I can't fly. And that kind of fear keeps me from getting hurt. But now if those fears keep me from going outside after dark, if they should keep me from riding in an elevator or an airplane, then I better get them down on this paper and take a look at them because they're controlling and ruling my life. I find really that the basic cause of most of my fears, usually they are centered around, I'm afraid I'm going to lose something I've already got. I'm afraid I'm not going to get something that I really want. Or I've done something I shouldn't have done, which creates a problem for others, and I'm scared to death what they're going to do whenever they find out about it. You know, that second column is headed up. What are they going to do to me? Am I perhaps going to jail? Am I going to lose something with material value? Am I going to lose face? Will it result in divorce? Will it destroy a personal relationship? Might I lose my job, etc.? Almost every fear that we have, there will be some root cause behind it. Column two, we put down the cause of the fear in a very simple procedure. Column three, what part of self is affected? Just like with resentments, I can't experience fear unless there's a threat to one of my basic instincts of life. If you threaten my social instinct in any way, my personal relationships, my self-esteem, my prestige, my plans for the future, my ambitions, if you threaten it in any way, it's going to bring fear to me just like it brings resentments. If you threaten my security, either material or emotional, in either case, it's going to create fear. If you threaten my sex life in any way, it's going to create fear. So I very carefully, in the third column, just like I did with resentments, I put down the part of self that is affected. And once again, I think as we fill out the third column, we're going to begin to see at least one part of self is really going to stand out. Maybe most of my fears are concerned with what other people think of me, self-esteem. Or maybe most of them are concerned with material well-being. Or maybe most of them are concerned with my sex life in some way. It's probably going to be a combination of all three. But at least one of them is really, really going to stand out and show me the part of self that I'm having the worst trouble with as far as fears are concerned. Also, when I filled out the third column, just like I did with resentments for the first time, I saw where fear came from. You know, I thought fear was just one of those feelings that flitted into your mind. You could do nothing about it to control it or do away with it or anything else. Today, I find fear comes from a threat to one of the basic instincts of life. And if my basic instincts are under control, if my relationship with God is right, you can do about anything you want to me to, to me, and I'm going to, not going to experience fear from it. But also, if my relationship with God is not right, if my instincts are not under control, just about everything you do or say to me is going to create fear. So once again, now that I'm able to see where fear comes from, with God's help, I'm able to start getting a little bit of a handle on it. Never could do that before. Column four. What did I do? Just like with resentments. What did I do, if anything, to set the ball rolling and set in my, and motion trains of circumstances which have led to my being in a position to have the fear? As I begin to list in that column, what did I do that creates that fear in the first place? I once again begin to see, just like I did with resentments, almost invariably, I did something based on self, which later placed me in a position to have to experience that fear, so on and so forth, as the result of what I've done. I begin to see that the, the things that I actually do that creates the fear in the first place. Column five. Where had I been selfish? dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, 
or inconsiderate, the same as with resentments. You know, if I wasn't so selfish, I wouldn't have to be afraid of losing what I've got or not getting what I want. If I wasn't so dishonest, I wouldn't be running around lying and cheating and stealing and having to worry about what you're going to do whenever you find out about it. If I wasn't such a self-seeking, frightened individual in the first place, I wouldn't have to experience so much fear. If I really considered what you need and what you want as much as I consider what I need and what I want, I wouldn't have to experience near as much fear. But I'll guarantee you, if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, I'm going to keep on doing the same old things I've always done. I'm going to keep thinking the same old thoughts I've always thought. And fear will literally eat me up. Blocks me off from the sunlight of the Spirit. And eventually causes me to go back to drinking again. But just think. If I could become a little less selfish. If I could become a little less dishonest. If I could become a little less self-seeking and frightened, if I could become a little less inconsiderate of others, then maybe I wouldn't have to experience and feel so much fear. And then maybe I could find a way to live where I could be sober and be peaceful and happy and free and not have to go back to drinking again. At the very least, I'm going to have to do something about these fears, just like I had to do about resentments. Now, if you fill this sheet out, I think the same thing is going to happen to you probably that happened to me. The same thing that happened to me when I took resentments. When I finally figured out that I let other people control and dominate my thinking through my resentments toward them, and especially those that had already been dead and buried in a graveyard, that began to look pretty dumb and pretty stupid. And we don't like to look dumb and stupid, and a lot of those resentments begin to disappear when I really saw the truth behind them. Now, if you think resentments look stupid, just wait till you get your fears down on paper and look at them. Mm. <laughs> they look double, double dumb on paper. Oh, man, they look great in your head. There's a reason there for every one of them. But if you get it down on paper and really, really see the truth behind that fear... It looks double, double dumb to you. And about 95% of those fears are going to disappear also, just like with resentments. But also, just like with resentments, there's probably going to be one, two, three, or four fears that have been embedded in our minds so long that we're going to have to have a little extra help to get rid of them. We now come to the second prayer in step four in the big book on step four. You know, you always hear people talking about the step three prayer, the step seven prayer. You never hear about the prayers that are spread throughout the entire book. We had prayer in step four to get rid of resentments. Now then, let's look at the prayer that we have in order to work on these deep, deep deep-seated fears, Joe. See, prior to me doing step three, I lived on the idea that I didn't need God, nothing, or nobody. It wasn't going to be up to me. But now I've done the third step prayer. And it says here in our book on page 68, perhaps there's a better way. We think so, for we're now on a different basis. The basis of trusting and relying upon God. See, I didn't trust or rely upon God, period. Now I'm trusting and relying upon God. We trust our infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role He assigns. Just to the extent that we do as we think He would have us and humbly rely on Him, does He enable us to match calamity with serenity. Now, we never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think that spirituality is the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it's the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. I didn't have any faith. I didn't even believe. But now I have faith. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let Him demonstrate through us what He would have us, what we can do. Now, here's the prayer. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And at once, we commence to outgrow fear. You know, my sponsor told me that the most important to them, the two most important things about prayer, absolutely, was one was to start 
and the other was to continue. The two most important things about prayer. Can't heal a sick mind with a sick mind. Only God can heal a sick mind. We hear always about the promises on page 83 and 84. We never hear about the promises that are spread throughout the entire book. And Joe just read one of the greatest promises I think can be found anywhere in this book. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what have us be instead. And at once we commence to outgrow that fear. We do the same thing with these deep-seated fears that we did with resentments. As they pop up in our head, we ask God to take them away. We ask him to show us what he would have us be instead. And at once we begin to outgrow that fear. And over a period of a couple of weeks, we're going to find that that particular fear will disappear. And then if we got another fear, we work on it also. Just like with resentments, working on those one at a time. And eventually we can be free from fear to the level God intends us to be. We'll never be entirely free of it. We'll never be completely free of it because we're not supposed to be. You know, if we didn't have some kind of fear, we couldn't live. Hell, I couldn't walk across a crowded street out here without getting hurt real bad if I didn't have a little bit of fear. That brings caution to me and keeps me from getting hurt. You know, if we didn't have a little bit of fear of what we think of each other, we probably couldn't have this meeting this morning because we'd start telling each other what we really do think, and the meeting would break up in a hell of a hurry if we didn't have a little bit of fear. <laughs> so we'll never be completely, completely free of it. But most certainly we can get it to the level that God intends for it to be. Now just remember yesterday this little file cabinet that I had up here in my head that was full of fears. As I worked this inventory process, about 95% of them disappeared because they looked so stupid. The other 5% can be removed through prayer. And that means that that file cabinet, the damaged and unsaleable goods caused fear, called fear, has now been removed. And once again, God's not going to allow another hole in my head. I've got enough of them already. And if the fear disappears, it's going to have to be replaced with something else. And the only thing that can replace it will be the opposite of it. And where my mind used to be filled with fear, today it's filled with faith and courage. And I find that I can do many, many things today that I was afraid to do before. I also find that I've been able to quit doing some things that I was afraid to quit before. A little bit of more peace of mind, a little bit more serenity, and a little bit more happiness. A very positive happening. Now, if you've got a fear deep-seated in your mind and you don't go on to want to get rid of it, just like with resentments, we better get it on this paper and look at it very, very carefully. Because if we've got a fear that we don't want to get rid of, then we're probably using it to rationalize and to justify not doing things we really should do, or just as importantly, doing things we shouldn't do. Let me give you for an instance. And I want you to be truthful with me this morning. How many of you in here this morning would like to go back to school and finish your education? Could I see your hands, please? A whole bunch of you want to. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you another question. How many of you really intend to do that? Could I see your hands? Probably less than 25% of the hands went up this time. Why? Nothing in the world but fear. Nothing in the world but fear that we can't measure up. Fear of hard work. Fear of what other people are going to think of us. Actually keep us from doing things we really would like to do. And in that way, fear controls and dominates our thinking. If we got those kind of fears, we really need to get them on this paper. We really need to look at them. We need to work on them. We need to ask God's help with them. All my life, I wanted and I loved to work with my hands. And I always wanted to build a set of kitchen cabinets. For some reason, it was I wanted to build a set of kitchen cabinets. But I never would do that. Because I knew if I did, there would be a lot of mistakes in them. They wouldn't look very good, and people would laugh at them. And fear kept me from building them. 
Well, one day after having worked this program for quite some time, I decided to build a set of kitchen cabinets. Now, they don't look very good, and there's a lot of mistakes in them, and people laugh at them, but I don't give a damn anymore. <laughs> I think it's quite easy for us to see where fear really does control us, or it does really does rule us, and really does dominate our lives for us. Now, we made a decision to let God do that, and if fear does, God can't, and it's just that simple. Now, once again, we're in the process of doing step four, so we're going to put a little four up on the top of the sheet. This is the fear section of it. In column five, I now see the exact nature of the wrongs that I'm going to talk about to another human being. The fear is the wrong. That's what blocks me from God. But what's at the core of it? And I see those same old things at the core of the fear that I had for resentments. In the fifth column, I see the defects of character that I'm going to be willing to turn loose of in step six. In the fifth column, I see the shortcomings I'm going to ask God to take away in step seven. And quite naturally, some of the names in column one will be people and institutions that I've harmed, and I'm scared to death what they're going to do whenever they catch me. So those names will come off of column one. They'll be added to the sheet to be used later on when we get into steps eight and nine. And the thing that really surprised me is I began to see a lot of the same names appearing on the fear sheet that I had on the resentment sheet. You know, I resented Barbara, but I feared Barbara also. I'm still a little bit afraid of her today. <laughs> if she ever finds out everything I was doing 34 years ago, she's probably going to file for divorce again. <laughs> I resented the Internal Revenue Service, and I feared the Internal Revenue Service. I resented the police department, and I feared the police department. I was amazed. I'd never tied that together in my head before, how closely resentments and fears run together, and how much they really do control and rule and dominate my thinking. Absolutely amazing what we learn about ourselves. Okay, now we talked also yesterday in this little store that I've got, in this storeroom behind my head back here. I found that it was filled with guilt and remorse and shame associated with the people I'd hurt in the past. And if I want God to direct my thinking entirely, I'm going to have to do something about that shame and that fear and that guilt and that remorse. Because as long as it's there, it controls the way I think, and God can't. You know, we've repeatedly said that we alcoholics are different than drunken bones. We alcoholics have a conscience. We know the difference between right and wrong. And we do many things whenever we're drunk that we wouldn't do sober. And then we sober up and we think about those things, and the guilt and the remorse just literally, literally eats us up. So if I want to get full, complete peace of mind, I'm going to have to do something about that too. And I can't do anything about it until I look at it truthfully and honestly. So we find it at the bottom of page 68, it says, now about sex. It seemed as though we human beings hurt other people faster and easier in the sexual area than we do any other way. And I think there's some good, valid reasons behind that. You know, we're a little bit different than the other animals here on earth when it comes to sex. The other animals here on earth, they have the same kind of sex urge that we do so that they can and will reproduce themselves. But the difference in their sex life and our sex life is that they don't have this thing called self-will. God gave that to human beings only. The other animals here on earth, when it comes time for them to reproduce herself, God usually signifies that by some change in the female of the species. The male senses that change, the two of them join together, 
And it's kind of like, bang, bang, thank you, ma'am. And when it's over with, they normally go their separate ways. Not always, but usually they go their separate ways. But the difference in their sex life and ours is that they didn't have any choices when they're going to do sex. That's done on God's time at God's direction. They don't usually have any choice in who they're going to have sex with. They don't usually have any choice in whether they're going to have it with one or more sexual partners. Well, they can't even have any choice in how many times they're going to do it. And they can't even decide what position they're going to do it in. There so far you see very few sexual problems amongst the other animals here on earth. <laughs> I've never seen a cow on a psychiatrist's couch yet <laughs> talking about sexual dysfunction. We human beings are a little bit different. You see, God gives us thing, this thing called self-will. And we can have sex any day of the year that we wish to. We can choose who we're going to have sex with. We can decide whether we're going to have sex with one or more partners. We can even decide how many times we're going to do so as long as we're physically capable of doing that. And we can even decide what position we're going to do it in. You know, tell me there's something like 64 different positions a human being can have sex in. I have no idea what they are. <laughs> I only found three in my lifetime. <laughs> and two of those damn near kill me. I'm not sure I'm going back to them. He gets excited, doesn't he? <laughs> So what we're going to do here for just a few minutes this morning is we're going to look at how we do sex. We're going to try to look at how we think about sex. Because how we think about sex determines how we're going to do it. And that in turn determines whether it's going to hurt other people or not. And that in turn determines whether we're going to have to feel the fear and the guilt and the remorse associated with those things. And Bill does it for us in a big book in a very, very masterful way. He said, now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there. Now, you older fellows, don't get your hopes up. We're, we're not talking about physical. We're talking about mental. But above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we found opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. And you and I have heard them all of our lives. They're the ones that say sex is a dirty thing, that you ought to do it at one time in one position with one person only, and the only reason to do it is to reproduce yourself, and if you enjoy it, it's a sinful thing. I've heard them as far back as I can remember. They are to the extremes on one side. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. And you hear them today. They're the ones who say you ought to be able to have sex anytime you want to, anywhere you want to, with as many people as you want to. You ought to be able to enjoy it every time, and if you don't, there must be something wrong with you. you know, maybe they call that the sexual revolution. The main thing I see wrong with it, it happened two year, 20 years too late for me to participate in it, I know that. <laughs> they are to the extremes in that direction. Now, the book says one school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? 
And I read that last statement with great relief. As I knew this book was getting ready to condemn me for what I had been in the past, I knew it was getting ready to tell me what I was going to have to do in the future, and I'd already made up my mind that I wasn't going to pay any attention to it at all. And I'm glad to find out that we're not going to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We simply are not going to get into that question, period. This book is meant to be helpful to anybody anywhere, anywhere in the world, especially we alcoholics. And if we start trying to tell people how they're going to have to conduct their sex life, then surely, surely, we're going to begin to alienate people. Besides that, what's sexually acceptable in one part of the world may not be acceptable at all in another part of the world. So we're not even going to get into that question. What all we are going to do is see a way that we can review our own past sex conduct that we can take a look and see the people we've harmed by that conduct and see if maybe, maybe we can't make a few changes in it and still be able to engage in and enjoy sex in the future, yet at the same time not end up hurting other people and not have to feel guilty and remorseful for it. And it's going to be a very... Very simple procedure, Joe. We're going to do the same thing about sex as we did about resentment and fear. We're not going to psychoanalyze ourselves and say that we have, the reason we have all these problems is because Charlie said, Mommy sent me on a party chair backwards. What we're going to do is try to do what the big book says. We're simply going to find the facts. We're going to face the facts. And we're engaging in a process to ultimately accept the facts. And remember again, Dr. Jung said ideas, emotions, and attitudes which the guiding force of the lives of these people are suddenly cast to one side. Now, where did I get my ideas, emotions, and attitudes about sex? Well, my dad gets out of the nut house and an out of state relief, and he comes out to California, to Fresno. And my mother's back home with these five kids, letting them get bigger. Not, grow, not raising them up, but letting them get bigger, if you know what I mean. And uh, so I went to her, and I said, Mom, I've been thinking about sex. And she scared her. She said, Oh, my God, Benny Joe. That's my name, Benny Joe. <laughs> scared the heck out of her. She said, That's not a good thing to be thinking about, because I've been thinking about it for a long time to the point I almost had brain damage in thinking about it. <laughs> See, that's a dirty, that's what she said. That's a dirty, filthy, rotten thing to be thinking about, and you ought to save it for the one you love. <laughs> any of you ever hear that before yeah. I sure did well somehow thank God I didn't quite believe all that yeah. so I went to school where we had such education they called it recess <laughs> and I began to learn things wasn't satisfied with those answers but in West Tulsa, Oklahoma Charlie lived about three miles from where I did in West Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was a place called the Jenkins Cafe. In front of the Jenkins Cafe in the evenings, there was a bunch of wise, intelligent, experienced men and women who knew all there was to know about sex. And they were very, very happy to share it with you. About 15, 16 years old. Yeah, about 15, 16 years old. Brilliant people. <laughs> and those guys told me that they were having sex sometimes with three or four different girls a night. They said... And my eyes got that big around. And uh, sometimes they were going with them 10 or, 12, 10 or 12 times a night, they said. Now, the only fallacy of that is that I was sober two or three years now called synonymous while I figured out they were lying to me. <laughs> I never could live up to that. See? Now, I, I learned my sexual information on the street from people that didn't know any more about it than I did. You think I didn't need an inventory of this thing? You know, the first time I... I went out on my wife after I got married that first time, and I went out on my wife the next day. I felt bad. I mean, I really felt bad. I know you know today you're supposed to feel bad, but I didn't know it then. And the next time I went out, I did it again, and I didn't feel quite so bad the second time as I did the first. And then to my second marriage, as time went by, it got to where it didn't hurt at all. And these are the things with principles. If you don't have any principles to live by, Ultimately, you don't have any reasons to live. Such are principles. And then we start drinking for total oblivion. And that's where I found myself in the end. And that's the, that's the thing about principles. 
You know, the first time I went out, Charlie likes me to tell this, the first time I had sex, I was selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate. And I was also alone. <laughs> Would anybody here like to hear from me about sex? <laughs> How many of you kind of got your sex information somewhat like I did? I asked some people out here a while back at another place, and nobody raised their hand. I said, man, I must be really weird. That's why he wears glasses today, too. <laughs> Every time we say that, we look out there, and about ten of you guys jerk your glasses off and put them in your pocket. And gals, yeah. Okay, we now see a set of directions to review our sex conduct, almost the same as our resentments, just worded a little differently. So we made us of another sheet. We called it a review of my own sex conduct. Not somebody else's, but my own sex conduct. And here's the instructions. We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? That's the fifth column. Whom had we hurt? That's the first column. Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? That's the fourth column. Where were we at fault? What should we done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. So we're going to do the same thing here with a sex sheet that we did with a resentment sheet. Column one. Who did I hurt? Now, I doubt if there's anybody in this room this morning that ever hurt anybody in a sexual area that we don't know just exactly who that was. You know, that seems to be a form of knowledge that we all have. Now, there may be some questions sometimes as to, well, what do you do to hurt people in a sexual area? And, of course, we can hurt them in many, many different ways. If we're in a good relationship like I am with my wife, and I go outside of my marriage and have sex out there and she finds out about it, then surely, surely I've created a problem for her. If that little sexual escapade creates a problem in my home between my wife and I, then I've hurt my children by the same thing. If the lady I had sex with out there, if it becomes common knowledge, I've hurt her too. And if she has a husband and children, I've hurt them also. Now, one sex act can hurt several, several different people. I think sometimes we hurt people in a sexual area simply by demanding they are more than our fair share. Maybe our partner isn't too keen about having sex every time we want to. And rather than consider their needs and wants, we selfishly demand that they have sex with us when they really don't want to. Surely when we do that, we create a problem for them, if not physically, at least emotionally. I think sometimes we hurt people in a sexual area by demanding they do things with us sexually they really would rather not do. For their needs and wants, we selfishly demand those things. Surely we create a problem for them when we do so, if not physically, at least emotionally. I think sometimes we hurt people in a sexual area simply by withholding sex. You know, maybe we're not too keen to have sex every time our partner wants to. And sometimes, rather than consider their needs and wants and desires, we selfishly withhold sex when perhaps we should give in a little bit more often. Many, many ways we hurt people in a sexual area. I think we all pretty well know what they are, and I think we know who we've hurt. Column one, we simply make a list of these things. And once again, you can't really see the extent of this until you get it on paper. You can only see one sexual harm at a time in your head. But when you get it all down on paper, I think for the first time we begin to realize how many people we really have harmed through sex. Column two. What did I do to harm them? You know, we hurt people in many ways when we, when we are demanding they have do things and have things with us that they don't particularly want to do. I simply put down the thing that I did that created the sexual problem. 
What did I do? They demand that, did I demand they have sex when they didn't want to? Did I demand that they do it in ways they didn't want to? Did I do it outside of marriage and hurt somebody? Many different ways. We put them down in column two. Column three. What part of self is affected here? Now, I think this can be one of the most revealing things we've ever done for ourselves in this third column when it comes to sex. Now, you would think that if I hurt anybody in a sexual area, it would be caused by the sex instinct. And I guess once in a while, that's probably true. In order to get the physical, the, emo the emotional gratification that comes at the moment of successful completion of the sex act, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing at the wrong time with the wrong person because of the sex instinct. But if I look at each situation very carefully, I think I'm going to find the other two instincts are involved just as much, and maybe even more so, than the sex instinct itself. Now, I'm going to express an opinion, and I want to be sure everybody understands it's my opinion. It's not Joe's opinion. It's not AA's opinion. It's my opinion. I am convinced today that God gave us the sex urge so that we could reproduce ourselves. I'm also convinced he made it a very pleasurable thing so that we would do so. I don't believe you and I would do the kind of work involved in sex if we didn't get some kind of reward for doing it. And we know that one of the greatest, greatest feelings that a human being can have is at the moment of successful completion of the sex act. One of the greatest feelings we can ever experience, both physically and emotionally. Now, if we're doing sex for a reason other than production, reproduction, or enjoyment, we just might be doing sex for purposes other than what God intended. For instance, we boys found at a very early age that you can use sex to build your self-esteem. After all, the more members of the opposite sex you can have sex with, the greater man you really are, we thought. Now, we boys called that John Wayneism. I don't know what you girls called it. Jane Wayne, Joe says. <laughs> And some of you girls tell me that you use sex for the same purposes. Now, that is not to reproduce. That's not to enjoy. But that's to fulfill a part of the social instinct of life. Sex really doesn't have a hell of a lot to do with that. Sometimes we use sex to buy a personal relationship. Maybe we're just lonesome. Maybe we just want somebody to pay attention to us. And we found out a long time ago we can give sex and buy back a personal relationship. Now, that has nothing to do with reproduction or enjoyment. But that's also to fulfill a part of the social instinct. Sex really doesn't have a hell of a lot to do with that. Sometimes we use sex to buy material security. Maybe we're in a sexual situation we really would rather not even be in. But we become so overly dependent upon another human being for material security that we give sex to buy back security. That has nothing to do with reproduction or enjoyment. That's to fulfill the security instinct. Or sometimes we use sex to get even with another human being. Maybe we're in a relationship. We find that our partner's gone out and done something they shouldn't have done sexually, and we say, we'll show them. And we'll go out and do identically the same thing. And the fallacy in it is, is after we've done it, we can't afford to tell them we did so. But there are certainly, we didn't do that in order to reproduce or to enjoy. We used it to get even with another human being. Sex doesn't have a hell of a lot to do with that. Why, sometimes we use sex to force our will on another human being. Maybe our partner isn't doing what we think they ought to do. We say, we'll show them. We'll just cut them off at the pass, and we won't let them have any sex until they come around to our way of thinking. 
Now, we boys aren't too good at that. We only last about two days. But you girls have honed it to perfection. You know exactly how to do that. And I don't blame you. I'd do it too if it worked that good for me. But that's not to reproduce. That's not to enjoy. That's to force our will on another human being. I was absolutely amazed when I filled out this third column and began to see that the things that I've done wrong sexually that in a majority of the cases didn't even really revolve around sex. It revolved around the other basic instincts of life. And when I saw that, a lot of my guilt began to disappear. I thought I was just a dirty, rotten, no good SOB. But I found out that I did some things sexually that hurt other human beings, not because I'm a bad human being, but because I'm a sick human, a sick human being. And I use sex for purposes other than what God intended to fulfill the other basic instincts of life as much or more than I did for sex. Also, when I saw what I was doing with it, my desire to go do it at the wrong time in the wrong place with the wrong person began to become less and less and less. Because you see, I always thought I was oversexed. And I found out through this little inventory sheet, I wasn't oversexed at all. I was under secure. And I used sex to build my security and my self-esteem. And that began to look kind of dumb to be doing those kind of things. And a lot of the desire to go do it in the wrong time in the wrong place began to become less and less and less. And I began to get a little handle on this sex thing right here in this third column. God, I think it's one of the greatest things we can do for ourselves to honestly look at this thing. Column four. What feelings did I create in others? Did I unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? What should I have done instead? You know, not only are we looking at the things that we've done that hurt others, but we're trying to shape a new sex life in the future so that we'll still be able to engage in it and enjoy it, yet not hurt others. So we need to be looking not only at what we did, but we need to be looking at what we should have been doing in the first place. And that helps us in the future to guide us in our sex life. Column five. Where had I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate? Same basic character defects. If I wasn't so selfish, I probably wouldn't be doing those things sexually that hurt other people. If I wasn't so dishonest, I wouldn't be sneaking around behind my wife's back and lying to her and engaging in those kind of things. If I wasn't so self-seeking and frightened, afraid of facing life without that extramarital sub, I probably wouldn't have been doing it in the first place. If I really considered my wife and my children first, I wouldn't be doing those things that will probably end up causing harm for them in the first place. You can bet your boots, if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, I'm going to keep right on doing the same old things. I'm going to keep right on hurting people, and they're going to retaliate, and I'm going to resent, and even if they don't catch me, the fear and the guilt and remorse is going to eat me up and it's going to block me off from the sunlight of the Spirit, and eventually I'm going to get drunk. At the very least, I'm going to have to come to terms with some of this stuff and really see what's been happening in my life. Now, once again, we're in the process of doing step four. This is the sexual part of it. In the fifth column... We again see the exact nature of the wrongs we're going to talk to another human being about when we take step five. In the fifth column, we see the shortcomings we're going to ask God to take away in step six. And quite naturally, all the names in column one will come off of this sheet and be added to the sheet later on to be used for steps eight and nine. And when I'm through with this and I've given myself all the information I need, resentment-wise, 
fears wise, sexual wrongs wise, for steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Another thing surprised me too. I kept seeing the same damn names appearing in the sex sheet that I had in the resentment sheet and the fear sheet. Barbara was on all three sheets. You know, I resented her, I feared her, and I certainly heard her in this area. I even had the Internal Revenue Service on all three sheets. <laughs> I resented them, I feared them, and I gave them a pretty good screwing before I got pregnant. <laughs> Okay, it says, in this way, the way we just described, in this way we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subject, subjected each relation to this test, was it selfish or not? We're going to use prayer three different times now. Here's the first one. We asked God to mold our ideals and to help us to live up to them. We re remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good neither to be used lightly or selfishly or to be despised or loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we've done harm, provided we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem, more prayer. In meditation, we ask God what we, what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. Now, God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with other persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid historical thinking or advice. You know, this is an area that we probably don't need a whole lot of advice anyhow. You know, I think each one of us, we really know down deep inside ourselves what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. I've never been into a sexual situation yet that was wrong that I didn't know it was wrong before I ever got into it. Didn't keep me from getting into it. But I knew it was wrong before I ever got into it. I don't think we really need a whole lot of advice in this area. Besides that, if you run around and start asking four or five different people for sexual advice, you'll end up with four or five different answers, and then you're going to have to try to decide which one of those to follow. Besides that, I can't think of a worse place in the world to get sexual advice than Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I don't think we need a whole lot of advice in this area. We just listen to that voice inside. Now, suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we're going to get drunk? Well, some people tell us so, but this is only a half-truth. It depends on us and our motives. Now, if we're sorry for what, what we've done and have an honest desire to take, let God take us to better things, we believe we'll be forgiven and have learned our lesson. Now, if we're not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we're quite sure to drink. We're not theorizing. These are facts of our experience. To sum up about sex, more prayer. We earnestly pray for the right ideal and for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and for the strength to do the right thing. Now, sex is very troublesome. We throw ourselves harder in helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the horny condition. Oh, excuse me. It quiets the imperious urge. <laughs> Same thing. When to yield would mean heartache. Old Bill had some fancy words, didn't he? Okay, now we're going to do one more little sheet before we're through with the inventory. When we get to steps eight and nine, the book says we have the list. We made it when we took step four. Some of those people on a resentment sheet, we, we found that we had hurt them. Some on the fear sheet, we found that we hurt them. All of those on the sex sheet, we found that we had hurt them. But there's still probably going to be some people that we've harmed in other ways that haven't really shown up yet on any one of these three sheets. So we're going to suggest another little sheet looks just exactly like the others. And we call it a review of harms other than sexual. In column one, we put down who do they hurt. Now, these are ones that haven't shown up yet. Who did I hurt? Column two, what did I do? Column three, what part of self is affected? Column four, what feelings did I create in others? And column five, which character defect is involved? 
And then we're going to have the information for step four, five, six, and seven, eight, and nine, for people we've harmed in ways other than sexual. And we finish this sheet, and we have everything that we need for steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, period. Now then, we're ready to go on with the rest of the program. It tells me at the bottom of page 70, if we've been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. Now, a lot of people don't like the word analyze. But to analyze simply means to get down to the truth about something. We have taken a fearless, moral, truthful, analytical inventory. We've looked at the truth about ourselves. He doesn't say it, but we've listed and analyzed our fears. We've listed and analyzed our sexual harms. We've listed and analyzed those harms other than sexual. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. Now here's some positive results. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies, for we look on them as sick people. My God, what a change in personality is already beginning to take place. For an alcoholic to begin to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill, great changes already. We have listed the people we've hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from Him. If you've already made a decision, Step 3 and an inventory of your grosser handicaps. Step four. Step, yeah. yeah, step four. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> I had one of those senior moments. I told you we've learned how to sleep with our <laughs> eyes open. That's why we... oh, I, I wasn't sleeping. I was thinking. <laughs> Which is about the same thing. If you've already made a decision, step three, and an inventory of your grosser handicap, step four, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. Now, what are our grosser handicaps? Resentment, fear, sexual harm, and harms done to others than sexual. What are our grosser handicaps? Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate attitudes. See, the book recognizes here that we're not going to do this perfect that we'll never do it perfect, that the best we can possibly do is take a look at these grosser handicaps, get some of this stuff out of the way, gather up some information so we can get on with the rest of the program. We have another step later on called Step 10, where we're going to continue to do this process every day for the rest of our lives, and we'll gradually get better and better and better. In step four, we do the absolute best we can with what we've got, and that's all we can do. Now, the greatest mistake I see people making in AA, one of the great mistakes, is they're sitting around in AA waiting to get well so they can do step four perfect. And when they've got the cart before the horse, we've got to do step four so we can get well. And we do the best we can with it here, according to the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. And we've had some great positive changes here already. You know, we got rid of resentments. Replaced them with love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill. We got rid of fear. Replaced that with faith and courage. We have looked at those harms we've done to others. We've begun to see that sex really wasn't our problem. It was in mainly in the other areas. And we begin to see those things we're going to have to change in the future if we want a little peace of mind, serenity, and happiness. There was a young lady that we heard of who was having, she was sober about six months, and she was having a real problem with this sex thing. 
she went to the sponsor and said, sponsor said, I'm having a real problem with this sex thing. I just don't know what to do since I've been sober. She said, well, if you'll go to the big book and turn to page 69, all the information about sex is on page 69. I don't know why that's true, but it is. And if you'll do and read and do what it says, you'll probably get some of that straightened out. So she went home and got out her big book, and she got a little confused. Instead of going to page 69, she went to page 96. Let's turn to page 96, and let's see what information she found there. I think that's one of the most appropriate things I've ever read. It just goes on and on and on and on. Okay, it's just about lunchtime, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and stop for this morning, and we'll see you guys later this afternoon. Yeah. John will be back at uh, 1:30. By the way, the winning ticket. I'm Charlie Parman. I'm a very grateful recovering alcoholic. That's Charlie. And I realize your program says eight and nine and the promises, but we're going to do uh, five, six, and seven first. And we, we're kind of stretching it out a little bit anyhow today because uh, John's not going to be here in the morning. And uh, we'll finish the session up with our big book stuff in the morning. And we'll probably be pretty close on time. But I imagine by the time we get through with our drawing and everything else tomorrow, we'll be out of here around, I would guess, about 1130. Uh, we should be able to be through by that time. So this afternoon, uh, we, we, we've worked on uh, step four. Uh, we filled out four sheets for step four. Uh, we filled out our resentment sheet, and we filled out our fear sheet, and we filled out our sexual harm sheet, and we filled out harms done to others in any other way other than sexual. Uh, we found out a lot of information as we filled those things out. Uh, for most of us, for the first time, we, we began to realize how resentful and how fearful we really were. Uh, for most of us, we begin to realize that we've let those resentments and let those fears and shame, fear, guilt, remorse, and etc. pretty well dominate our thinking for a long, long time. Uh, we always thought we had control of our thinking. We were always proud of the fact that we stand on our own two feet and we don't need anybody else's advice and nobody tells us what to do. But as we really do these inventory sheets, we then begin to realize that really all about all we've ever done is just respond to other people. And through our resentments toward them and through our fears and etc., they have controlled and they've dominated our thinking as far back as we can remember. And we've made a decision to let God direct it, and those things, if they direct it, then God can't. Those are the things that's blocked us off from God's thinking. We did our sex sheet, and for most of us, we find out that sex isn't our problem anyhow. Uh, for most of us, we use sex for purposes other than what God intended, to be able to build our self-esteem or to buy security or develop personal relationships and so on and so forth. We never did know any of that, and we put it down on this sheet of paper and got a good look at it. We also inventoried the harms we'd done in any other way. So when we were through with that, we had a real good inventory on resentments, fears, uh, sexual harms, and harms done in any other way. Also, we got some real positive results. Remember, resentments would disappear, and as they were removed, they were replaced with love, patience, tolerance, compassion, goodwill toward our fellow man. Uh, the fears were removed, and that would be replaced with faith and courage. During the sexual thing, we began to see what we'd really been using sex for, not for sex, but to build our self-esteem and etc. We began to see a way to develop a new sex life in the future where we can still engage in it and enjoy it, but at the same time not hurt other people. So we got some good, good, positive results as we did step four. We also found out that step four, there was nothing to be afraid of. Nowhere did we make a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items. 
we found out that it wasn't too awful complicated. It was relatively simple if we just followed the simple little directions in the big book, and it wasn't really that hard to do. You know, we spent probably all together here about uh, four hours talking about three to four hours talking about step four, and it really doesn't take a hell of a lot longer than that to do a step four if you really get at it and work at it, because it's just not, not that complicated to do. So our suggestion is that anybody that's been procrastinating on it, anybody that's been putting it off, go ahead and get with it and get it done, because we're never going to get it perfect anyhow. We looked at our grocer handicaps, and we found out what they are, and now then we're about ready to start doing something about their removal. So let's go to Chapter 5, page 72, and we'll move right on into Step 5. I mean, chapter 6. Chapter 6, I'm page sorry. 72. Yeah. Chapter I had 5 on my mind. <laughs> chapter 6, page 72, and we'll start looking at this stuff. My name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. This chapter 6 is called Into Action. It's not into thinking. It's into action. And action is always a magic word, and I'll call it synonymous. <clears throat> Since having made our personal inventory, what should we do about it? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? So we've been trying to get a new attitude. Remember, we were trying to get some new ideas at, and uh, emotions and attitudes about ourselves. But we're trying to do that here. And a new relationship with our Creator. Remember back on page 45, it said the main object of this book was to enable me to find a power greater than myself, which would solve my problem. So I began, began to develop a new relationship with my Creator and to discover the obstacles in my path. And what are some of those obstacles that it's in my path? What's resentment and the fears and the harms done to other people? And we've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. Uh, excuse me. We have asked, uh, after we have admitted certain defects. What are those defects? Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate attitudes. Those are my defects. We've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory. Now these are about to be cast out. This requires action on our part which when complete will mean that we have admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our defects. This brings us to the fifth step in the program of recovery mentioned in the preceding chapter. Okay, now then we need to look at a couple of words here before we go any further. We know that step five says we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. But if you notice here in the narrative on this step, he said, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our defects. In the step, he uses the word wrongs, but in the narrative, he uses the word defects. People used to ask Bill about this. Bill, how come you use wrongs in the step five, yet in the narrative, you use the word defects? And by the way, Bill, what's the difference anyhow between a wrong in five a defect in six, and a shortcoming in seven. Now, we've known two ladies that worked with and for Bill for years, and they both tell us the same thing. People would ask Bill those questions, and he would kind of rear back, and he would smile, and he would say, well, when I took English and writing courses in college, they taught me never to use the same words over and over. That shows how dumb you really are. You know, you know, you know. He said there... <laughs> He said there are really no differences in these things. He said in step four, we're going to find those things that block us off from God. In step five, we're going to talk about them to another human being. In step six, we're going to become willing to have God remove them. And in step seven, we're going to ask him to take them away. And he said you can call them anything you want to. A wrong, a fault, a mistake, a defect, a shortcoming, a character flaw, or whatever you wish to. And we're going to notice in the next couple of pages that's exactly what he does with these things. I followed it up later on into the 12 and 12, and in step 6 and 7 and 12 and 12, he does it even worse there than he did in the big book. So we're convinced that in Bill's mind, these things were all exactly the same. We find them, we talk about them, we become ready to get rid of them, and we ask God to take them away. 
Let's see if we can't see that as we go through here. So this is perhaps difficult, especially discuss, discussing our defects. He did, it, first. he did it again right there. And again, we're going to discuss our defects, which is our selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightening, and inconsiderate attitudes. Those are the main things we're going to talk about and we're doing our fifth step. But we think we've done well enough and admit these things to ourselves. There's doubt about that. In actual practice, we usually find that a solitary self-appraisal is insufficient. Many of us thought it necessary to go much further. Will we be, be more reconciled discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reason why we should do so? The best reason first. If we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. That's probably a pretty good idea to go on with the program and to do our fifth step. You know, I, I think this right here, you know, the book says that solitary self-appraisal is insufficient. I did the very best I could do with my limited knowledge filling out these forms and taking my inventory. Now I take them to another human being, someone who's done this before me and could help me see things that I can't see. And one of the reasons why we talked about being brief and all of these filling out all of these forms, four or five words, and basically just to remind me to talk about them when we get over to step five. And now I can take this to another human being and explain these and we can talk about these from left to right, gleaning all the information we can all about each one of those columns. And my sponsor questioned me and questioned me about things in one column at a time and one thing at a time all the way across. We got to the fifth column. That's where he really got in, got into me, talking about the selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightening, and inconsiderate attitudes. He's trying to point out to me that those are the kind of attitudes that I had and the kind of problems that caused me to have those attitudes that caused me all my other problems. A solitary self-appraisal is insufficient. And to show you the reason why that is true, if I look around this room today, I can see a lot of defective characters. The one sitting right there. One sitting right there in the second row, yeah. right on the end, right there. The reason that is, I can see your defective character very, very plainly, because there's nothing between you and me but air. You see, but if I had any defective character, you could probably see mine. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I can see yours plainly, but I can't see mine because there's a lifetime of rationalization and justification dealing with mine. I have a hard time seeing past that. And that's why I need another human being to help me see things about me that I couldn't see because I'm beginning to make changes here. I want these changes in my life because I want to quit having all the trouble that I had. And I need to change attitudes in order for this to happen. He said in the book, we'll be more reconciled to discussing ourselves with another person and we see good reason why we should do so. The best reason first, if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Now he spends, sends the rest of this page and the next page explaining to us why that's true. He said time after time newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this hunting experience, they've turned to easier methods. Almost invariably they got drunk. Having persevered with the rest of the program, they wondered why they failed. Well, we think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. They took inventory all right, but hung on to some of the worst items in stock. They only thought they had lost their egoism and fear. They only thought they had humbled themselves, but they had not learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all their life story. Now, there's a little statement that created all of our confusion in step four. We read that all your life story thing, and we thought, well, that must be what they want us to do then, is write our life story back there in step four. And that's what many of us did. And like I said before, I wrote my life story, had about 92 pages in it. Took it to another human being, he looked at it, said, not very pretty, is it? And I said, no, and he said, you'll never have to be that way again threw it in the wastebasket. I learned nothing to contribute to my alcoholism from my life story. And also, as we said before today, I realize that 95% of my life story has nothing to do with my alcoholism, but it very effectively covered up the 5% that did. But I'll tell you what I have done by doing the inventory the way book says to do it. I've shared all my life story resentment-wise. My resentments didn't come just today or yesterday. 
Those resentments have been popping in my head as far back as I can remember, way back to my early childhood. I've shared all my life story fears-wise. Those fears didn't come in there just yesterday or today. They've been popping in my head as far back as I can remember. I've shared all my life story harms-wise. I didn't hurt people just yesterday or today. I've been hurting people all my life. And my mother told me one time, she said, Charlie, you were the meanest kid I ever saw. Huh. She said, I had a little trouble loving you myself. <laughs> when Mama's got a little trouble loving you, you're, you're doing some things you shouldn't be doing. And I've shared all my life story harms-wise. And as I really look at it, all my life story revolves around those three things anyhow. Those things that created the resentments and those things that created the fears and those harms that I did. So I'm very well reconciled with the idea I've shared all my life story if I do the inventory the way the big book says to do it. Now then, he says, more than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. He's very much the actor. To the outer world, he presents his stage character. This is the one he likes his fellows to see. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but knows in his heart he doesn't deserve it. The inconsistency is made worse by the things he does on his sprees. Coming to his senses, he's revolted at certain episodes he vaguely remembers. These memories are a nightmare. He trembles to think someone might have observed him. As fast as he can, he pushes memories far inside himself. He hopes they will never see the light of day. He is under constant fear and tension, and that makes for more drinking. Now, psychologists are inclined to agree with us. We spent thousands of dollars for examinations. We know but few instances where we've given these doctors a fair break. We have seldom told them the whole truth, nor have we followed their advice. Unwilling to be honest with these sympathetic men, we were honest with no one else. You know, it really doesn't make any sense. But we alcoholics will go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and We'll pay them whatever their fee is today, $100, $150, $200 an hour, and we'll lay down on their couch and we'll lie to them all the time we're laying there. You know, we're not about to tell them the truth. Let's face it. We alcoholics have become the world's greatest con artist. You have to be if you're going to be a practicing alcoholic. You've got to learn how to lie. You've got to learn how to con. You've got to learn how to manipulate. You gotta learn how to steal if necessary. And I think the one that we con the most is ourselves. I really don't think you and I could have lived with ourselves out there doing our thing if we'd had to see the truth about it while it was going on. But you see, Dr. Silkworth says we really could not differentiate the truth from the false. We had a little thing we called resentments. And we played them over and over and over in our mind and gradually, gradually, changed the picture and finally transferred all blame to, to other people. We've never, never before been really honest with ourselves. So at the very least I can do, and I take step four, is do the best I can. But now then I need to take my inventory to another human being, one who has walked this walk before me, one who understands step four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine out of the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. One who really knows what I'm trying to do and have them help me see those things I can't see about myself. Now, they're not going to change anything in column one. They're not going to change anything in column two. But they're probably going to change some things in column three. You know, that's where I really learned about this sex thing. When I, when I kept on saying this was caused by the sex instinct, the sex, they said, no, 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 no. He said, all you're trying to do here is build your self-esteem. He helped me see things I couldn't see. He's probably going to change some things in the fifth column. And I said, this one was caused by fear. And he said, no, not this one. This one is plain damn dishonesty. That's all this is. And he helped me see things within me that I can't see. No human being, no human being can be absolutely honest with themselves. You know, the greatest spiritual minds in the world today will tell you that they need to discuss these things with other human beings because they're looking at it from an outside view 
and they can see the truth where we can't see the truth. That's the real value at step five. Now, I know confession is good for the soul. And I know if you belong to a religion that requires it, you need to do that. But I also know we should then still take it to somebody who really understands this program. You see, I'm getting ready to start out on a lifetime-changing program. I need to be sure that those things I'm trying to change are the things I should be trying to change. And left on my own resources, I can't do that. I just can't be that honest with me. That's the real, real purpose of five, is to extract all the truthful information about ourselves that we possibly can out of step four. Okay, now we're going to say who, uh, when we go to page 75, on page 74 it tells us who we're to take this, the inventory and take our fifth step with. And the book says those who belong to a religion, religious domination which requires this confession must and should do that. And also it goes on page 74, there wasn't too many experienced sponsors around in those days, and they talked about going to other people or closed mouth friends or so on and so forth. But I think today there's enough people who are, uh, have had experience in the fifth step, especially our sponsors around AA, and we can take our fifth step with another human being in AA and get a whole lot better look at it. you got to remember the first person out here in California that got a copy of this big book. There was no other AA people or no sponsor for them to turn to. So page 74 is telling them how to find somebody to take it with. But that's not true today. we got lots of good AA people. we got lots of good AA sponsors that really know and fully understand steps 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. I think that's who we need to be taking our fifth step with so they can help us learn all we can possibly learn about ourselves. So when we when we decide to hear our story, when we decide who is to hear our story, we waste no time. Page 75, first paragraph. says that time factor again. We waste no time. Right after we do the step four, we do step five, quickly as possible. I called my sponsor, Franklin, and asked him if I could come over and do my fifth step. He said, sure, we can come over and do my fifth step. And so I drove over to his home, which was about eight hours away, and arrived that Friday afternoon, middle of the afternoon. I said, I'm ready to do my fifth step. He said, I know you are. He said, but first of all, let's you and I do the third step prayer together. We ask God to be with us in this thing. And that's the kind of sponsor I had, and that's the kind of sponsor I am because of that. He said, we've written an inventory and we're prepared for a long talk. We explain to our partner what we are about to do and why we have to do it. He should realize we've engaged upon a life and death errand. Most people approached in this way would be glad to help. They would be honored by our competence. And Frank and I began to discuss these columns one, one column at a time across from left to right. He asked me all kinds of questions and trying to see what, what was behind a lot of these things and helped me see more things that I couldn't see. And he finally began to point out to me my selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened attitude. He did that uh, many, many times. And we discussed these things at great length. And here's where we can tell somebody, somebody else all our life story. Because in the fifth step, you will be, you will tell someone all your life story if they ask you questions about it. There's more there's more promises once we do this fifth step too, and here they are. We park at our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark granny of the past. Once having taken this step, withholding nothing, we are delighted. We can look at the world in the eye. We can be alone in perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. Step two, we came to believe, but now we're beginning to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I know about me for years. I used to lay awake at night thinking about how I could get all this stuff fixed just one more time. If I just get everything back to zero. If I could just get that fixed and this fixed and that fixed, I'd be okay. I knew that, but I didn't know how to go about doing that. The time I got through with the fifth step, I could see the steps ahead, and I could see that I could get all these things fixed, and I was looking forward to going forward in the steps. As I drove home that afternoon, I thank God from the bottom of my heart that I was having this spiritual experience that I was having. I was beginning to feel free of all those old things that used to, practically kill me as a result of the fifth, fourth and fifth step. 
Now, after you've completed step five, you've done a lot of work through steps four and steps five. You're probably tired and you probably need to rest a while. And the big book is going to give us a little rest stop. It said, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour. <laughs> now, he didn't say 72 days, did he? He said one hour. Every time he mentions time in this thing, it's always at once or right now or one hour. Hey, you know, Bill's saying, let's don't take too much time on this. Returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. We don't know him yet, but we know him better. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals or steps. You see, he didn't want to use the word steps again immediately, so he called them proposals. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? And once again, we're referring to that wonderfully effective spiritual structure that we're building as we progress through the steps. Step one, willingness, was the foundation. Step two, believing, was the cornerstone. Step three, he told us we're building an arch that we're going to pass through to freedom. And step three was the keystone of the arch. And now then we put some more stones in place, steps four and five. So you see the vital spiritual experience is taking place as we progress through the steps. We don't have to wait till we get to step 12 to get something out of this thing. Every action step, there is a definite... Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.